the preservation of and increased access to the 92nd Street Y Humanities Audio Archives is generously funded by the National Endowment for the Humanities. Good evening, I'm Laura Kaminsky, Associate Director of Education, and it's my pleasure to welcome you to the second evening of our series, Critics on Criticism, Theater. The format tonight will be as usual. Following the moderated conversation on stage, there will be an opportunity for you to submit your written questions on the index cards you received upon entering the hall. In about 45 minutes, the ushers will come down the aisles collect the cards, and bring them backstage for presentation. As most of you know from last week, this series is moderated by Jane Moss, co-producer of Theatre Festival Incorporated and theatre consultant to the 42nd Street Redevelopment Project. Our guest tonight is an old friend of the 92nd Street Y, having appeared on our stage several times in years past, the always illuminating, always amusing, always eloquent John Simon. He's the theater critic of New York Magazine and film critic for the National Review, the author of Uneasy Stages, which is a chronicle of New York theater, and Singularities, Essays of the Theater. John Simon was born in Yugoslavia. He received his degrees at Harvard University, has taught literature at Harvard, the University of Washington, Bard College, and the University of Pittsburgh. Mr. Simon is a regular contributor to the Hudson Review and the New Leader, as well as Moore Magazine. His freelance articles have appeared in the New York Times, Vogue, Mademoiselle, Harper's, and the New York Times Book Review section. John Simon's published works include Acid Test, a collection of essays on all the arts, private screenings of film criticism, Film 6768, which he co-edited with Richard Sickle, 14 for Now, an edited an anthology of modern short stories with commentary and movies into film. We're delighted that he's with us tonight. Please join me now in welcoming Jane Moss and John Simon. Thank you. Do I have this right? I know, right? Um, first of all, I'd like to say that I'm very, very pleased to be interviewing Mr. Simon this evening. You don't think 100 years from now they're going to think it's Neil Simon that I was interviewing tonight. Um, I think that for most theater practitioners and many, many audiences, we have all benefited greatly over the years from the unique gifts of his prodigious intellect and his unwavering standards regarding what constitutes artistic excellence and significant theatrical achievement. Um, However, as much as I admire and in many instances concur with Mr. Simon's opinions about the theater, I realized I was very, very nervous about this evening. Um, perhaps more nervous than I've been for any of the other part, in interviewing any of the other participants. And it was about a week ago that I finally realized sort of what the source of my anxiety was about this interview um, and decided to correct it. Um, so I wish to make it clear at this point that I will not read any questions from the floor that solicit Mr. Simon's opinion of my physical appearance <laughs> or <laughs> that ask him whether he thinks my questions are grammatically correct or not. Um, my first question is, um, <laughs> in your essay, A Critical Need or Two, which appears in his collection of essays, Singularities, you make the distinction between criticism and reviewing. Could you speak to the audience about that distinction? Well, yes. Um, I guess a critic is someone who is a writer, whom one reads as a writer, who, who is part of literature, who, if all goes well, will remain part of literature in the future whose opinions, whose style, whose way of looking at the world, who's going into his subject and beyond his subject are all interesting enough to, to make this person part of the literary climate and the literary scene of that time and one hopes of time to come. Whereas the reviewer is someone who takes on a job reviewing plays or movies or uh, music or fine arts or whatever because it's a job and because he has some vague uh, 
college degree and because he happens to be working for that newspaper and that particular job falls open and they say, okay, Fred, how about you doing architecture for us? Uh, actually, with architecture, they're not that free and easy because even they know that you have to know something for architecture. Uh, but for theater and movies, you don't need to know anything. So if Fred is willing and if the job is available, Fred gets the job. So that's a reviewer. Do you think that reviewers are restricted to daily newspapers? No, no. Or can you uh, find them everywhere? <laughs> oh, everywhere, everywhere. Would that they were so restricted, then, then we'd know how to avoid them. Um, what made you decide to become a critic, and why did you select the theater? Well, I didn't quite select the theater. I selected a lot of things, and I've been writing criticism about art and ballet and a little bit about opera and a lot about movies and a lot about theater, quite a bit about books. In fact, I wish I were doing more about books because that's where the value is, so to speak. Um, so the particular branch I didn't choose, it's just that I happen to be interested in all of these arts and theater certainly is one that I've always cared about. So it was natural to pick that one rather than architecture, which I don't know much about. Um, but as to where, why I became a critic in the first place, it's because I was a teacher and teaching became harder and harder to do as more and more unteachable individuals paraded <laughs> in front of me and had to be passed, more or less. Otherwise, the teacher flunks up. And the football uh, team doesn't win. Yeah, yeah, that sort of thing. So the, and also... You know, I'd hoped to become a poet, and I was writing poetry, and I was publishing it a bit here and there. But it wasn't coming along in the right way. I, obviously, I wasn't going to make it as a, as a bona fide poet. So you take the sort of stylistical things that you've learned from writing poetry, and you take the um, intellectual things that you hope you have learned from teaching, which meant teaching yourself before you can teach anybody else. And you put them together and it figures that you then become a critic because that's something you can do on your own, in your own room uh, without having those illiterate students cluttering up the place. And you see you're teaching in a more genteel, in a more uh, civilized and also in a more widespread way because if you write even for a medium popular magazine, you reach more people than those 30 or 40 odd students. Many of the other participants in this series either worked as a director or as a playwright or worked in a theater or on a production. Have you ever done that or had any desire to do that? Oh, yes. To participate uh, you know, in the theater in a different way? As a student, and yes, as a student and in the army, uh, I used to do some acting, I used to do some directing. I, I was the director of the Harvard Radio Workshop, which put on plays over the radio, but still plays. And we tried to put on good plays rather than radio plays, and uh, which in those days were supplied by the likes of Arch Obler and Norman Corbin and all that sort of, those chaps. Uh, so uh, I was always interested in directing and acting, but not in a serious way. Let's put it this way, when I was very, very young, I may have even had delusions that I could do that, but I quickly knew better. What do you perceive uh, the relationship to be between criticism and the art form that you are criticizing? The relationship? Yes. Do you, I mean, do you see criticism as serving artists? Do you see it as well, serving audiences? Do you see it as creating a climate well, and a context for a piece of work? Well, you know, it's like planting. You plant a apple tree somewhere where there was no apple tree before, it's hard to know whom it's serving. Um, any passing traveler might rejoice in the beauty of that tree and might even filch an apple. It certainly serves the owner of the apple tree, which in my case is the editor of my magazine, let's say. Um, it's, it's hard to say whom you're serving. Ultimately, the only thing you are sure of is that you are interested in that art form, that you are concerned with it, that you care about it, that you want it to be as good as it possibly can, and that by your lights, whatever they may be, you want to help improve it. 
And if it means being stern, then you have to be stern. And if it means being gentle, then you are gentle. Uh, but whatever it is it takes to uh, help that art form be what you want it to be, which you want the best for it, the way every parent wants the best for his child, though his idea of the best is not necessarily the child's. Anyway, you do want that, and so you do it. And you do it in that sense for the art, and in that sense for the consumers of that art, which is to say the public, and the practitioners of that art, which is to say actors, directors, playwrights, whatever. But in the last analysis, you do it for yourself, because you are desperately interested in what movies or theater or dance or whatever it is are doing and you want to understand and you want to figure out why you like this or why you don't like this and what's good about it and what isn't good about it. And so you grapple with it and out of grappling with it you write this criticism, which is the way a poet writes his poetry out of grappling with the universe or a novelist uh, out of grappling with life and society around him and out comes a novel. What would happen if there was a theater without criticism? Let's say that there was a theater that, that had reviewers but didn't have sort of the extended, either the extended essay or the thoughtful essay written about it. Well, it is even conceivable that someday there might be a theater without reviewers because when you look at the way magazines and newspapers are mm -hmm. cutting back on their reviewers' space, um, and this is happening all across the country and in all kinds of publications, there's even, even reviewing is in danger, never mind criticism. Uh, well, of course, anything is possible. Uh, I do think that we're living in times in which the arts are undergoing changes of a kind that I think have never been there before. I think there is a, a uh, just as the hydrogen bomb is not like any bomb that was before, and it's no use saying, read your history books. And if you know what happened at the Battle of Crecy or what happened at Thermopylae, then you can predict what's going to happen in World War III. You cannot. Um, things can change so radically that, that there is no precedent, that there is no analog. And I think the arts are now in a state of, of convulsion, such as they've never been in. And it is entirely possible that everything will go, or at least everything will change, unrecognizably. So it's possible that we will have a theater without critics, without reviewers, even a theater without theater. What characterizes that convulsion? I what are the characteristics of that convulsion? Well, there are many. Uh, uh, the, the, well, there are at least several. One is that so much has been done already. Uh, in most of the arts, so damn much has been done. Uh, I feel, for example, that in, in, in the fine arts, I've been trying to say this for a long time, and I'm going to say it now, even if it's slightly irrelevant. The history of the fine arts stretches from anonymous to untitled. <laughs> and once you reach untitled, it's the end of that art form. Because when, when the artist, the Schnabel or the Rauschenberg or whoever the jerk is, is more important than the work of art, so that the work of art is untitled, who cares? See, in the good old days, the artist was unimportant, but the cathedral which he worked on was important. Uh, in the bad new days, uh, the cathedral isn't the cathedral anymore. It's a piece of garbage, but the artist, the so-called artist, is everything. So it's untitled number 12, untitled number 69, and so on. Uh, that's the history of art, and it's kind of finished, and the untitled gives it away. In the theater, it's not that clear yet, but I think we're approaching that, and that's why we can have Richard Foreman, and that's why we can have Robert Wilson. I mean, if it were opera, it would be called Goethe Demerung, but because it's theater, it's called Robert Wilson and Richard Foreman. Um, and um, it's, it's a kind of end, and with an end without a new beginning, as far as I can see. But I can only see as far as I can see. And, uh, but it's, it's this, this terrible, first of all, it's a loss of the word. I mean, the word really doesn't count for anything much anymore. Uh, Which will impact theater probably more, more than most art forms. Yes, 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 certainly. Uh, although the novel and poetry can <laughs> hardly details, live without Details, details. <laughs> uh, and um, that's one thing. But then beyond, or maybe not beyond, but parallel or with that, is, is the loss of an educated society. 
without a civilized, educated society, there cannot be a theater. Uh, there can be poetry, because poetry finds readers in strange little enclaves and survives on that. Not lavishly, but survives. But theater, which is expensive and communal and, and depends on some kind of social contract, social artistic contract, social cultural contract, needs uh, an educated society, a, a society that went to school together and learned something together, and, and that includes the playwright and the director and the audience and the actors, and, and together they make theater out of that. And every age that had a thriving theater had some kind of a more or less homogeneous audience, more or less agreed audience that, that, that agreed on certain things. The great ages of theater, if you look at them, in each of them there was an audience that had something in common and the playwright could have something in common with them and vice versa. But we have a complete splintering because education is splintered to hell and consequently the playwright doesn't know whom he's writing for anymore. The producer doesn't know whom he's producing for. He also doesn't know how to read the play anymore, but that's yet another story. Uh, and so, out of this total educational, cultural chaos, it is almost impossible to have a theater. Stanley Kaufman addressed this last week in talking. He felt that this was one that one of the reasons that British plays were, you know, quote unquote, superior to American plays, or that the overall quality of writing of British plays is superior to American plays, was because so many because England is still a homogeneous country, which mm -hmm. this country is not. Mm -hmm. Would you concur with oh, that absolutely. assessment? You see, it was, it was easy to have theater even in this country, let's say in the 30s and 40s, in New York, let's say. Why? Because there was an average theater goer. He was usually someone who was a first or second generation American. Uh, he was usually uh, Jewish, though sometimes he was um, other things, but he was someone who, who um, came, you know, for political reasons from troubled European countries and had a hard time of it in America, but wanted to get ahead and wanted to continue his cultural or her cultural heritage and whose idol was Yasha Heifetz and not Bruce Springsteen. And, and there were certain, uh, and, and you know, and not even necessarily Bruce Springsteen because maybe it's Boy George, but on Yasha Heifetz there was some kind of agreement. Uh, on, on Springsteen there isn't even agreement. There's nothing else, but there isn't even agreement. Uh, and so um, one knew what this person was and this person also sort of knew that there were such things as the classics and, and that Moliere was a good thing and that uh, uh, Schnitzler was a good thing, and, and Shakespeare was a good thing, and who the hell was Boy George? Didn't, such a thing didn't exist. And in music, one also knew what these people wanted. They wanted sort of the European operetta transplanted to the American ground with a little bit of jazz influence. That meant Gershwin and, and Cole Porter and uh, in the worst case, Irving Berlin, but, but, it, but one, one knew sort of what that was. And out of these, these, uh, these agreements, out of this consensus, one could make theater. But now one doesn't, for example, in a musical, how the hell does one know who wants what kind of music anymore? There's still the people who would like to see more Cole Porter and Noel Coward, though not the way it's done in Old Coward, God forbid, uh, and, and uh, who would still want to see whatever it is, Vernon, Duke, uh, Harold Rome, that kind of stuff, fine. But then there are the people who want rock, and then there are the people who want soft rock, and hard rock, and punk rock, and God knows what other kind of rock. There's probably a new one being born at this very minute while we're speaking. Well, now that, you've watched, now that Bruce Springsteen is no longer on the charts. <laughs> yes, well, so, you know, how, do you, how can you make a theater out of that kind of fragmentation, out of that kind of insane diversification? I don't think you can. This ties into a, an issue that was sort of a running theme last year and has come up last week, um, which was the tension in this particular culture between theater as art and theater as commercial entertainment, and that the dominance of the latter curbs the potential of the former. 
Um, and in your again, in your collection of essays, Singularities, you state that, quote, the time has come for the theater to make use of the fact that some hoi polloi have irretrievably defected to the movies and television, and so there is no need to keep wooing them. Instead, the theater can become an aristocratic art. Um, unquote. You further recommend the development of a serious theatrical culture in this country. I was wondering if you could amplify on your views about that. Well, I think the best chance civilized theater has, I'm sure there's uncivilized theater. I'm, I'm sure we can have Laurie Andersons from here to eternity if we, if we want them. But if we want civilized theater, I think we must think of it as chamber music rather than as, as the Roman arena with gladiators and, and quadrigas and, uh, and um, lions devouring whoever, Christians, Jews, blacks, you name it. Uh, you, have to, you have to think of it as something refined, something that's not going to draw huge audiences, something that's going to be for people who still read books, of whom there are fewer by the second. Uh, and uh, that means this kind of hall is just right. I mean, we don't need anything bigger than that. And it's instead of three men and with, you know, with um, violins and viola and a young lady with a uh, cello coming out on the stage, there'll be a few sets and a few simple uh, lights and we will do a play by Pirandello or Eugene O'Neill or whatever, or whoever the playwrights will be then. And we'll be perfectly happy. And the fact, and the Blue Springsteen count can go and screw themselves in some enormous Madison Square Garden, and we'll forget about them, and they'll forget about us, and things will work. Do you think such a thing is possible? I don't know whether it's possible, but I think it is necessary if if theatre, as I understand it, is to survive. Now, perhaps my theatre needn't survive. What role do you think your theater, I guess, I mean, it's sort of both in the ideal sense and in reality, um, what role does it play in America's cultural and intellectual life at this particular juncture? Well, I'm not sure that there is an intellectual and cultural life in America. If there were one, I could answer <laughs> that question more easily. Um, I think there are pockets of such life, the enclaves of such life, uh, that are groups who are actually willing to come here and pay money to hear the drama critic shoot off his mouth. I mean, that's very touching. And, 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 and perhaps, he's glad you're here. And, and perhaps even noble. But try to put this into a hall that is even a slightly, slightly bigger than this one, or try to do it in Detroit and see where you'll get. Nowhere. Um, so um, the problem is, um, I don't know that there is a cultural life. Uh, I, I, I see horrors wherever I look. I, I go to Toronto to, um, to um, see the Berliner Ensemble there, and afterwards the critic for the Los Angeles Times and the critic for the Detroit Free Press or whatever it is in Detroit, uh, and I go to supper together, and the guy from Detroit says, or they got the guy from um, Los Angeles as well. Larry here staged the boys in the band with an old female, all female cast. He really knows about women in men's parts or men in women's parts. We are somebody. I said, oh, I said, well, why did you do that? What did you gain by that? He said, well, it wasn't a question of gaining. It's that I had to direct a play at the university, and the drama club was very large. It had to be a big cast. Uh, there were mostly women in the drama club, so it had to be had a lot of women in it. And it was due in three weeks, so I had to do it very fast. So it had to do a play with which I was very familiar. I happened to know boys in the, ba in the band very well. So I, did bo I just changed the names, and it was fine. You know, it worked perfectly. All right, fine. So that's that. Uh, we know how sympathetic you are to non-traditional casting. And this is, see, this is your, your drama critic for the leading paper in Detroit. Uh, then another day you're sitting at a dinner party and you're sitting next to a so-called major Broadway producer who is now into, as we say, uh, <laughs> television producing. And she tells me that she is bringing Cyrano de Bergerac to, the, to ABC, a three-hour special. And it's going to be wonderful because it's going to bring the youth 
to Cyrano, or maybe the other way around, Cyrano to the youth. But in any case, it's going to make these two irresistible, this irresistible object and force and immovable object meet happily, naturally, on television, on ABC for three hours. And it's going to be Cyrano de Bergerac. Of course, with a musical score by her friend, the rock composer Roger Somebody. And of course, Cyrano and Christian will be dock workers in Hoboken. <laughs> And Roxanne is a singer at the local night spot. And instead of going into a monastery, she's going to go to a guru somewhere in an ashram and so on. And Sting is going to play Serena. And so she looked, I said, I said, that's disgusting. What's wrong with that? I mean, this is the only way that young people will get to know this wonderful story. I said, well, isn't there such a thing as language? I mean, isn't there such a thing as poetry? Or isn't there such a thing as the style of the original? Well, you know, they, they, they wouldn't buy that. And besides, she says, Sting is the most popular singer in the world today. I said, well, that tells us quite a bit about the world, doesn't it? So this is the thing I hear and see all the time. So where is this culture or this, this intellectual life? That do, you, will do you think that the problems with culture and the problems with intellectual life are restricted to America? I mean, do you think that, there, that Europe is better well, equipped to handle these issues? Well, it's, it's, it's spreading. Uh, the the, the, the uh, source of it is here, but my God, it's, it's already gone all over the world. And the Americanization of the world proceeds apace. And uh, I'm sure that you can stand in many parts of the world and feel just as culturally underprivileged as you would here. Do you think, and don't laugh at me when I ask this question, uh, do you think uh, criticism can change any of this? Or do you think criticism, and the flip question is, do you think criticism in the last decade, let's say, has suffered because of this? Well, it's, it's a circular thing. You know, the chicken makes the egg and the egg makes the chicken. I, I don't know where it begins and I certainly don't know where it ends. But uh, criticism could make a difference, but it would have to be the kind of criticism that would never exist in this society. I can't speak for Europe because I don't know it well enough. Uh, but in this society, here and now, it is inconceivable that the movie critics on television would not be Roger Ebert, would not be Gene Siskel, would not be Rex Reed, would not be Judith Christ. I mean, these things are inconceivable. Uh, if you want to be utopian about it and say if there were a certain number of Frank Riches, a certain number of Robert Brustein's, although God knows Brustein has lost a great deal of his halo. Uh, if there were a certain number of Stanley Kaufman's, if there were a certain number of uh, Eric Bentley's holding down these jobs on the Times, on, on the newspapers, except where the hell are the newspapers? We don't have any newspapers anymore. Uh, if, you know, the, if, if he doesn't collapse, Klaus von Bülow will be the next drama critic. Uh, and and uh, so it goes. Um, um, it's, 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 criticism could make a difference, but it would have to be a highbrow criticism, an intellectual criticism, a tough criticism, a criticism of the kind with which the management of the New York Times cannot live and will not live, a criticism of the kind of which the management of the Post and the News haven't even heard. Uh, and if all of these utopian things were possible, yes, I think it would make a change. I'm not sure what kind of a change it would make, and I'm not even sure that in the end it wouldn't louse up the economics of the theater, because it may be that in order to have any kind of theater in New York, we may have to have 99% crap. Uh, but it would make a change. I can't tell you what kind. I would think it would make a change for the better, but, but it's a guess, and it's a, it's a hazardous guess. Um. Again, in your collection of essays, Singularities, um, you had an essay called, entitled, quote, How Personal Can a Critic Get? Um, and you defend yourself from the frequently reiterated charge 
that the intellectual clarity and the many faceted insight that you bring to bear on the theatrical experience are severely undermined by your, this is what others say, your seemingly gratuitous personal attacks on performers, playwrights, directors, and as you've heard in this room, critics. <laughs> Um, you state in that essay, um, and I quote, it seems to me that a genuinely atrocious piece of acting, or for that matter, writing or directing, is an insult to God and man. To forgive may indeed be divine, to retaliate seems to me only human. <laughs> Um, do you feel that your need to retaliate ever distracts or distorts your critical focus um, on any given play or production? No, it keeps my juices flowing. <laughs> Without it, I wouldn't have lasted this long. Um, the only thing that enables a person of some intellectual background and some educational um, qualification to survive in this field is is the ability to pay them back for the insults to the human intelligence that they subject one to time and time and time again. And if I had to, if I were condemned like the poor unfortunate on Time magazine, who is a lost cause in any case, but, but on top of being a lost cause, he's condemned to writing only about the plays he likes. Uh, similar, similar ideas, if you can call that an idea, that's dignifying, <laughs> uh, prevail on many other publications uh, from Cosmopolitan up and down. Um, and under those circumstances, criticism is a priori, dead as a doornail. Uh, the thing that, that does keep me going is that if they make me eat inhuman excrement, uh, I can at least pay them back because uh, something has given me the power of uh, using words um, to the point and, and, and incisively and, 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 if necessary, destructively. And I make the best God-given use I can of that, of that time. <laughs> You, f you also maintain that, it, that an objective criticism, which it seems to be that a lot of people are seeking, um, is neither possible or desirable. And could you amplify on that? Despite your embargo on, gram on grammar questions, please let's say neither nor, not oh, neither. <laughs> I uh, knew it. Did I call but, it? Uh, uh, I predicted this. Uh, he was talking about William no F. Buckley at dinner. Let's have no questions. <laughs> uh, well, uh, desirable, I don't know. Um, perhaps it would be desirable if it were possible. But since it is not possible, it is, it is scarcely desirable anymore. I mean, it would be wonderful if we could, you know, flap our arms and fly, but we can't, so let's not desire it. Uh, what we can do is, is curb our subjectivity to the point where it's not plastered all over the place. Uh, you know, where it isn't uh, bitching. I mean, Rex, Rex, Rex Reed, when he writes a piece of criticism, he doesn't like it. It's, it's just a long snivel from beginning to end. <laughs> so a long snivel we don't need. Uh, or conversely, if, if one of those jokers uh, loves something, it's just a long gush from beginning to end. That we don't need either. That kind of subjective criticism or subjective whatever um, garbage uh, we don't need. Uh, but subjectivity is a human problem. It's a human attribute. We can't get away from it. Uh, uh, and it's, we shouldn't. I mean, it's the glory of our being us is that we are not machines yet, that we are not robots yet that we are not computers yet, although God knows the fine line that divides us is getting finer all the time. Um, so let's enjoy that subjectivity. Let's enjoy the fact that, that we like this and don't like that, or that we uh, like to see good-looking people on the stage because that makes us feel good and do not like to see ghastly-looking people. You don't? Oh, I didn't know that. <laughs> but, yeah, yeah, well, there you are. Uh, you see you're learning something all the time. Uh, and, and so we make the most of it. It, it. It's not an absolute law, and the reader knows that. The reader can discount that. 
what the leader should not do, in my opinion, is get all worked up about it. Because it's, if, if the leader happens to be of a different opinion, if the leader happens to think that looking at Barbara Streisand is a sublime joy, well, okay, then so much the better for that leader. He has a joy that I don't have. <laughs> he, should, he should feel gently sorry for me instead of violently outraged. Uh, it has always seemed to me in reading your reviews that you have an ideal picture in your mind of what the theatrical experience can be, which most current productions do not live up to. Um, what specific performances and or productions strongly influenced your, and informed your ideas and ideals about the theater? That's very hard to answer uh, because that is assuming that, that the human mind and the human soul is some kind of a mechanism whose path, whose trajectory can be traced or tracked or whatever it is. When, I don't know. Everything I've ever seen, I'm sure, good or bad, um, either through being a great inspiration or through being a tremendous turnoff, has in some way contributed to my evolving a set of values, and possibly, possibly some of the greatest things I have seen have uh, not been as influential as some of the worst things I have seen. Who knows? Um, all I know is that there is no performance, there is no piece of writing uh, for the theatre or for anything else that doesn't, there is no piece of directing. There's no piece of set design that doesn't in some way settle into one's mind as an example of something one wants or doesn't want or hopes to see more of or less of or none of and so on. And, and I can't point to that performance, you know, when I saw Burton do this or when I saw uh, George C. Scott do that or when I saw, um, I don't know, Jane Fonda do the other, that was it. I mean. I, no, they, there have been wonderful things and there have been terrible things and they've all somehow deposited themselves like part of, you know, of corals into that great big coral heap that becomes the critical mind. Have you ever changed your mind about a production or felt that you were either too harsh or too indulgent? Yeah, occasionally, but not often, not often. Um, because finally, I think if it's, it's, how should I say, it's, it's part of, of being a, a competent judge, let's say, in a sports event, is to call the play as you see it and not to stoop to argue with the fans. You ignore the, the Coca-Cola bottles and the beer cans. You say that that player is out and maybe there is some possibility that he actually made it to third base, but no, you say he's out and you have to stick by it. Uh, so there's even a, a kind of a moral reason why you sort of have to stand by your judgment, but there's also a, an intellectual reason, which is that um, really people who have strong opinions um, don't change them very much, and people who have wishy-washy opinions shouldn't be critics. Do you often see a production twice? Yes. Um, if, I, if, I, if I particularly like it or particularly hate it, um, I may see it twice in order to get at the bottom of it more conclusively. However, this is much easier to do as a film critic because it's very easy to see a movie twice before you write about it. It's, it's not that easy to see a play twice. You don't have the time and it's not that easy to get the seats, even if you are a critic. Of course, if you're the New York Times, I suppose they'll throw seats at you until they come out of your ears. But the moment you're something less than that, it's not that easy. So usually you have to make do with, with one viewing. But I often go back later just to sort of see whether I agree with my own judgment, and usually I do. Do you find that the process of, of reviewing a play is different than the process of reviewing a movie? or that? You're no. engaged in different ways by, the, by film than by theater? I don't think it's different from it at all. Uh, it's just a matter of, um, of 
responding. You sit there and you imbibe. You don't um, turn on special, you don't push buttons, you turn, don't turn special knobs, you don't uh, uh, psych yourself out, you don't um, drink a magic potion, you don't uh, blindfold your, you know, your, your peripheral vision, although there are critics who do that. Um, you just sit there and you, you take it all in, like any other person who is sitting in that theater. And then you go home and you write the review. Uh, there is no um, special apparatus or hocus pocus or magic formula or anything. Was that your question? Yeah. Not the yeah. yeah. Um, Robert Brustein stated here last year, and I think he has repeated this probably in the New Republic as well, is that we are currently enjoying the golden age of American playwriting. Uh, do you agree with that assessment? As you can tell, I don't think the audience does. I mean, I wish, I wish my chemistry were better so that I had my metallurgical table before me so I know which is the <laughs> lowest metal of all. And that's the kind of age we're having. Uh, um, I don't even know the name of it, carborundum or something. Uh, um, it's, it's, no, it's, it's not. Um, but, on the other hand, it is very human. I, I sympathize with, with anyone who feels obliged to fool himself in that way. I think it's a, it's a touching, almost forgivable kind of intellectual weakness. Of all intellectual weaknesses, it's the most lovable. I just don't happen to share it. Uh, because, you know, it's hard to function in a, in a hostile environment. And it's, it takes a lot of thickness of skin and, and toughness of stomach to go into that particular salt mine or, or, or sulfur pit or whatever the daily theater has become and go back there day after day, night after night and, and, and sit through, have I got a girl for you and, and Raggedy Ann and Into the Light and, and even worse things whose names don't even get mentioned in polite society. Uh, and one does it, nevertheless. Uh, so there are various ways of coping with this. And one, the most naive, the most sentimental, the most simple-minded, but not the least lovable, is to pretend that things are better than they are. It's not my way, however. Do you think the situation is distinctly worse than it was in 1970? I don't know, was 1970 a particular good year? <laughs> no, no, I'm thinking 19, in the past, then it was uh, 10 years ago, 11 I mean, years ago, 12 years ago. I mean, do you, have you seen a distinct yeah. decline? Um, well, let's put it this way. The more splintered the audience gets, the, the, there is a decline in education. There is no doubt about that. As a former college uh, teacher, I do try to keep a little bit of track of what's going on on the campuses. And I talk to former, I mean, colleagues of mine, and I occasionally give a lecture at a university or college. So I have some notion of what goes on. And there is no doubt in my mind that every year, the students at the best universities, never mind the worst ones, get slightly more illiterate. And slightly more illiterate considering where they're beginning from is, is quite a bit. Um, so that uh, given that situation, uh, naturally things have to get worse even since 1970. I imagine in 1970 there would have been two and a half percent more people who would have been able to follow a sentence in a British play in which people still speak in sort of flowing sentences, say the common pursuit. Now there are two and a half percent fewer people who can follow those sentences. So that makes a difference. Do you have um, favorite American playwrights? I mean, any particular playwrights that are? Yes. Uh, doing, talking about that is a little bit like swapping baseball pictures, but, but, but I... I think I, the audience I mean, would like to see that. But I can, I can, I can, yes, I like Eugene O'Neill like everybody else. I like Tennessee Williams like everybody else. I like, um, you know, Blanford Wilson. I like, um, uh, I, 
I, I reasonably like Marsha Norman, um, although she's been disappointing me. Uh, I, I like Tina Howe, I like Ted Talley, I like a lot of people I like. Uh, the problem is, do these people have legs? I mean, obviously the ones who are dead already and who have finished their contribution, we know whether they have legs or not. But uh, about someone like um, Sam Shepard, for example, I don't know whether he has legs. I mean, for me, he has yet to write a real play. I don't think there is a single one. Buried Child comes nearest to it, but even that isn't a play as I understand it, uh, although it's pretty good. Uh, but there isn't a finished piece of work from that pen, or whatever he writes with it probably isn't a pen. Uh, uh, and um, so it's, well, one needs time and distance and perspective to be able to say who the uh, current playwrights are and the future playwrights will be. Uh, it's good enough to be able to, to know who the past playwrights are because people are forgetting in the most shocking way that there were great playwrights in the past. They don't get produced, they don't get seen, they don't get read, they don't get talked about. And, you know, a few of them do. Uh, they're sort of critics, darlings. Brecht will always be talked about. Uh, uh, Beckett will always be talked about, and rightly so. But there, there have been playwrights just as good as Brecht and Beckett who do not get talked about. And they, and they disappear, and they're forgotten, and that's, that's bloody unjust. Do you, would you agree with Stanley Kaufman that British playwriting is by and large superior to American? the work of American parents? Well, yes and no. Uh, I think it's, it's easy to wax sentimental over the other side of the fence. Uh, nevertheless, there is some truth to the fact that there's a little more literacy left over there. Uh, it's, it's fading and, and disappearing rapidly, but there is a little more left. And to that extent, I mean, a play like The Common Pursuit which is a very nice play, not a masterpiece, but a very nice play, uh, probably couldn't be written in this country because it's a play about intellectuals. It's a play about intellectual pursuits. It's a play in which what's debated is to a very large extent intellectual values um, and uh, coincidentally moral values as well. Uh, and that is not what a Sam Shepard play is about. God bless Lanford Wilson, it still is to some extent what he writes about. But um, it's not really what Shepard writes about. Or if it is, it is written in such a way that one doesn't really know which end is up. Um, and David Mamet, we don't even speak about David Mamet. Never. Um, you wrote an essay called A Step in the Right Direction, which you wrote in 1970, just to bring up that magical year again, uh, in which you identified the absence of good directors as the most critical problem facing the American theater. Um, I sort of have a two-part question, uh, one of which is whether you think that problem has been solved and whether you think, we know the answer to this part of the question, the integration of such avant-garde directors as Richard Foreman, Joanne Acolytus, and Robert Wilson into the mainstream theater, um, as well as the importation of such strongly visual European directors such as Andre Chabon and Liv Chule has in any way remedied the situation? Well, you see, as I've grown older, I've become more modest in my expectations. I would now even settle for bad directors, as long as they're not the people you have mentioned. <laughs> uh, uh, I, you know, I mean, if I could, you know, I would be perfectly happy now with, with people like John Sticks, if anybody <laughs> still remembers John Sticks. I remember Sticks. John Sticks. Uh, or whoever they, Britain Windust, or whoever they all were, uh, Guthrie McClinty. Um, anything but, but Peter Sellers, anything but André Chabon, anything but, but Richard Foreman, anything but this miserable creature, Anne Bogart, who at this very moment at NYU is putting on a, um, a production of Georg Büchner's, uh, which play is it, um, is it Danton's Death, or is it, or is it, I think it's Danton's Death, in which all takes place in some kind of uh, East Village 
bars or something, and, and the characters are not the French revolutionary characters, but they're East Village barflies or whatever, and so on. I mean, just, just to be rid of these people, I would be perfectly happy to settle for bad, old-fashioned... What is that? your objection to those people? Well, that, that they have Because there have no, been other people in the series who have endorsed their work, and I think it would be valuable they to... They have no respect yeah. for, for the text. That's, that's my objection. They, they are, they are uh, arrogant little pipsqueaks. They may even be large pipsqueaks. They may be young, old, fat, thin. When I say little, they're intellectually and morally little. I don't mean physically. I'm not always concerned with the physical appearance. <laughs> uh, and... Uh, Especially but in I'm protected. Especially in directors. Um, and uh, <laughs> so um, they're people who are essentially sterile, unproductive, unimaginative little people. All the things they call us critics, in fact. And they want to be the authors of, of the evening's entertainment. They want to be the creators. Now, they, they cannot write a play. They can't even write a bad play. But what they can do is ruin a good one. And so they take your, um, your wonderful play. And this includes Bob Brewstein and what goes on at Yale. This, in, this, goes, this cuts across in all kinds of directions. I'm not just talking about a little spot here and a little tiny area there. Um, and they take these things and they, they butcher them for their own satisfaction because they have no love for these things. They have no understanding for these things. They don't know that a play by whoever it is, let's say by... O'Neill, let's say, by Schiller, let's say, by Moliere, let's say, by uh, uh, Congreve, whatever, that these plays have an incredible wealth of ideas in them. And all you need is to present these ideas in a, in a faithful, respectful, loving way, intelligent way, and, and there's absolutely no need to transfer them to the 25th century that there's no need to put Fidelio on stilts the way Sherban has done in London. That there's no need to have Lear, King Lear played by a 11-year-old uh, hunchback, you know, uh, or better yet, by an 80-year-old woman pretending that she's an 80-year-old male hunchback. Uh, that, that this not only doesn't add anything to the play, but manages to obscure what it is. I mean, I, I vomit when I hear someone like James Earl Jones on the radio the other day saying, I don't trust the audience. I don't trust their aesthetic impulses. I don't trust their sexual impulses. They wouldn't let me play a woman, for example. Well, I mean, where, why, where the hell is it written that James Earl Jones should play a woman? He can barely play a man. Why the, uh, so why should he play a woman? You know? But that's his inalienable right, you see, under the new dispensation. Can you think of any director that uses, uses either now or in the past, that used um, sort of an expanded visual vocabulary where it was indeed in support of a text where it could be a, a radical interpretation of the text, but in support of that text. Well, the problem with radical interpretations is they're what sell uh, nowadays to producers or to audiences or to one, but they, a radical interpretation is never really at the service of a text. It is, it is the nature of a radical interpretation to to assert itself at the expense of a text. That is really the definition of a radical interpretation. And that's why we don't need them. What we need is a, a, a classical interpretation, which is to say a thorough understanding of what went on in 1783 or whenever this play was written and how people felt and dressed and moved and talked and breathed in 1783. And if you can reconstruct that in the most faithful, in the most uh, uh, loving and, and solicitous and, and considered and careful way, then you will have something so radical that most young people who are going to the theater today will never have seen anything like it. That's what we have to give them. One final question, which is, um, it seems to me in the last several years we've seen the rise of... Um, I guess what is most 
I guess the f most familiar phrase is performance art, where there's sort of movement away from the presentation of a traditional play, and it's more about the presentation of a performance. And I think of Bill Irwin, Eric Bogosian, even Lily Tomlin on Broadway. Um, and I was wondering what you thought of this trend. Well, again, it depends. I think it's interesting. I mean, someone like Eric Bogosian cannot be dismissed out of hand. I mean, there is real talent there. Um, it is not my idea of theater, but who is to say that my idea of theater is the be-all and the end-all? And it may indeed be the, um, the precursor, the harbinger of things to come. Um, so it, the, one has to distinguish there too. I think Eric Bogosian, yes. Laurie Anderson, no. Um, X, yes. Y, no. Uh, and so on. And then, of course, the future may prove one right or the future may prove one wrong, but those are the chances one has to take. But I think one must never abdicate one's attempt to distinguish between better and less good in any form, whether it's a form that's very close to one or whether it's a form that seems very new. One must never abdicate the right to make distinctions and to perceive uh, discriminatingly better and worse. So these people you mentioned, there's a possibility that some interesting new theatrical form may come out of it. But I don't think it'll be of much use in, in doing uh, uh, that scene. I mean, I don't think you'll ever be able to do that scene uh, either Eric Bogosian's way or Robert Wilson's way, even though the poor darling thinks that he can now do Wagner and things like that, and Salome and God knows what else. Uh, um, but um, but they, may, they may eventually end up doing something that will be useful, that will be worthwhile, that will be some form of theater. Uh, but the people who hail every one of their stumbling, staggering, uh, semi-literate lurches in the direction of something as accomplished masterpieces, uh, those people, I think, are, are very much in the wrong, in my opinion. Okay, moving to the audience questions now. Um, why won't homogeneity ultimately stultify the arts? For example, without the cultural and ethnic mix this country has, would we have West Side Story in Oklahoma or a streetcar named Desire? Isn't it more likely that we happen to be in a period which lacks talent rather th than the lack of a homo homogeneous society? Well, when I say homogeneous, I obviously don't mean homogeneous in the sense that one person can't be a Westerner and the other person can't be an Easterner, that, that, that West Side Story and Oklahoma cannot be fitted into the same theatrical framework. On the contrary, they can be splendidly fitted into the same, into the same framework, and they have been, and they are, and they will be. Uh, but what we cannot have is someone who would come in having heard, let's say, nothing but punk rock since the day he was born, and suddenly he is confronted with Rogers and Hart, or suddenly he is confronted with, uh, with uh, Cole Porter, or suddenly he is confronted with Kurt Weill. And he wouldn't understand that. I mean, and why should he? If all he has ever heard is punk rock, I mean, he can't understand that. So it is that kind of fragmentation, into a cultural fragmentation. I'm not concerned with diversity in religion. I'm not concerned with diversity in social background. But there has to be some kind of shared impetus, some kind of communal um, standard which, which prevails in San Francisco as much as in Boston, in, in uh, um, Austin as much as in um, Chicago, uh, but beyond that, by all means, let let there be a mix of every kind. By all means, let these some of these people be descendants of uh, Polish immigrants and others, Mayflowerites, and so on. As long as they can have strivings that share something, as long as they can have. Um, read things together and, and enjoyed those things, not literally together in the same room, but in similar school systems. 
then it's fine. Uh, look, the, the Elizabethan theater subsisted very well on a tremendous gap. At the, one, at the one end was the aristocracy and the court, and at the other end were the groundlings. But somehow those two groups were still not that far apart from each other, but that they could enjoy Shakespeare together. Not necessarily for the same reasons, and not necessarily for the same degree, but still on the basis of some shared communal experience, knowledge, uh, strivings, um, social concerns, they still spoke each other's language, and that's how Shakespeare was possible. Today, I think Shakespeare is not possible, except with super titles. And then you're no longer looking at the stage, then you're reading super titles. Do you consider Samuel Beckett a great writer? Could you comment on Waiting for Godot and Crap's Last Tape? Yeah, of course I could, but would there be much point in it? I, I, I have written on these subjects, and anyone who wants my views on them should read my views on them, because what I've said in careful consideration, sitting at my desk, reflecting and writing and putting my best words forward, is going to be much more worth than some flip little opinion, yes, no, terrific, not so good, pretty good, up and down, that I could give you now. Yes, I think those, are very, those two are very important plays, both of them. But why and how and to what extent, I urge you to read what I've written, if my opinion is worth it. And if it's not worth it, I certainly don't want to vulgarize it by reducing it to a flip sentence or two. Moving right along here. Uh, will you name some plays currently running on Broadway or off-Broadway that you enjoyed seeing? And what is it that you liked best about each play? Well, that I cannot in, answer. In 60 seconds. You see, this is the mentality, I'm afraid, that is the enemy of culture and the enemy <laughs> of, of Aren't theater. you glad these questions are anonymous? Uh, because people want shortcuts, and they want spoon-feeding, and they want, uh, they want, you know, Malarmé said that, that there are people to whom words could be replaced by small coins that we put in one another's hands. Uh, you know, give me a dollar, you know, and you'll make me happy. I mean, and don't have any opinions. Don't just, just, just give me something certain and tangible and, and possessable and I'll be happy. That's not the way culture works. Um, anyone who wants to know what a critic is all about and what he likes and what he dislikes and, and why simply has to read that critic. There is no shortcut to this. Sorry. We all agree that the world can't stand still. I'd like to know what new areas in the arts you feel positive about. Well, I feel positive about every new play, let's say, that I like. Um, if Tina Howe comes along with something called uh, Coastal Disturbances and I find wonderful things in it, then that's one of the things that I feel good about. Uh, if... Um, uh, the uh, the wonderful Brazilian painter living in Paris, Maria Vieira da Silva, paints a new painting that I'm impressed with, then that's what I feel good about. But I don't uh, say I look forward to more green triangular paintings, and I don't look forward to more green triangular plays. Um, it's a theory is something that I find very boring and, and ultimately sterile. Uh, theories of drama and theories of literature will get you nowhere. Um, sitting down with individual instances and liking them or disliking them and analyzing them and figuring out what they're about, that's what will get you somewhere. And that's the kind of criticism I believe in and I hope practice. With your intellect and need for intellectual stimulation, why do you continue to write for such a shallow, yuppie magazine as New York? Uh, well, first of all, show me a magazine that isn't a shallow, yuppie magazine. Uh, uh, there are not very many of those. Um, and next, show me a magazine that isn't a shallow, yuppie magazine that has drama criticism in it. Uh, it would be nice to write drama criticism for, uh, for what? For Daedalus, but Daedalus doesn't have drama criticism. 
It would be nice to write drama criticism for, um, you know, some really wonderful magazine if some really wonderful magazine existed. But we have what we have, and we must make use of what we have. Um, one could also say, isn't it, isn't it, isn't it beneath your dignity to go to see uh, uh, the next junky musical or the next junky sitcom type of? comedy that will come to Broadway tomorrow or today or, or the next day. Of course, in one sense, it's beneath one's dignity, but in another sense, this is the work one has chosen to do, and for better or for worse, one does it, and one does it in whatever magazines one can. I write film criticism for the National Review. I do not espouse the politics of the National Review in the least. Well, maybe in the least, but only in the least. Uh, <laughs> I, um, and after six you know, o'clock, I write uh, drama criticism for New York Magazine. I don't necessarily even read what's in the front of the book, much less endorse it. Uh, one does what one has to do as best one can, where one can do it, and where one can reach an audience. And one is not responsible for the preceding page, and one is not responsible for the su succeeding page. One is only responsible for one's page. And I think if one does an honest piece of work there, that honest piece of work survives, no matter what's framing it. Uh, you can hang a great painting in a lousy frame, and it'll still be a great painting. It may suffer a little from it, but it won't be uh, vitiated by it. Uh, I'm not saying that my reviews are great paintings, but it's, it's an analogy anyway. Uh, and um, so, you know, I have no compunctions about that. But yes, if there were truly magnificent magazines and if they wanted me and if they gave me more space rather than less space, I would be very happy to write them. And please, whoever asked that question, start such a magazine and hire me. Why is your criticism so frequently ad feminum rather than ad hominem? Oh, yes, well, sure. It's because, as I have often said, and as, as, as no one, I think, can honestly deny, uh, aesthetic involvement and sexual involvement are very, very closely related uh, because, you know, we're human beings and, and our senses and appetites and ideas and feelings and emotions are all very much entangled with one another. Consequently, whether we like it or not, um, and it's not, I think, either something to deplore or something to rejoice in, it just is, uh, our aesthetics are, to some extent, sexual. Consequently, our aesthetics are keener where our sexual interests are engaged. And if you happen to be a male heterosexual critic, you're more involved with the aesthetics of women than you are with the aesthetics of men. If you happen to be a male homosexual critic, and under God's just dispensation, there are plenty of those, uh, you are more involved with male uh, physical uh, properties. And if you're a woman critic, and thank heaven, there are more and more of those, and I welcome this, then again you're more concerned with, with male, except women's emancipation still has a bit of a way to go, and they don't quite dare to, to, to write openly about how much they lost after this star or that actor, but they will, and I shall be there to cheer them along when they do. <laughs> Is vengeance for a poor piece of theater a proper purpose for criticism? Well, again, it depends on the kind of vengeance. If I went out and shot the playwright, I think <laughs> that might be slightly excessive. <laughs> uh, but if I write the review that he deserves or she deserves, then I think, and if the play was, an, as I say, a dreadful thing and the review is a dreadful thing, then that's uh, perfectly fair. Are you improving the theater or, or are you merely venting your spleen? Well, again, one doesn't know. Uh, it, it's, it, it depends. If the theater is a huge rhinoceros and you are shooting it with uh, spitballs, then obviously you will neither improve it nor disimprove it. You will have absolutely no effect on it whatsoever. If the theater has any kind of sensitivity, 
And if your reviews have any kind of just and intelligent and, and perceptive value, then there is a small, small chance that you might effectuate a tiny change for the better. And that's all I can hope for. If theater is always to issue from consensus, doesn't it risk becoming stagnant? Yes, and that is that is a problem with not only our theater, but even more our movies, not even to mention television. Uh, uh, the more cooks there are to ruin the broth, the more ruinous the broth will become. There's no doubt about that. And uh, the best kind of theater is the kind of theater where the author is firmly in command and in control. And to the extent there's less and less of that, and there is less and less of that, um, I think theatre suffers from it, yes. And movies even more so. I think what this question is addressing is the whole issue of, for example, British playwriting being superior because it comes from a homogeneous culture. Mm -hmm. And I think what this question is addressing, doesn't it therefore run the risk of becoming stagnant that there is something about well, this shared vocabulary that can prevent mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Well, new again, forms from emerging. I don't know. I think, I think genius is always a whole world unto itself with all kinds of different voices and varied perceptions and, and wide uh, sensibilities at work. So that the, the theater created by a genius is a multi-voiced theater, is not homogeneous in the dumb way in which a Neil Simon plays homogeneous, or in which a, uh, uh, I don't know what, a musical is homogeneous, because, because even though there may be 13 so-called minds working on that musical, put them all together and you've got half a human mind. And, and that's, that's, that's probably very homogeneous, but, or not homogeneous, or whatever, but whatever it is, who needs it? Whereas a genius is an enormous world unto him or herself, and is in no danger of being stagnant, because that's what genius is about. It's, it's, it's about moving ahead, about perceiving, and of getting deeper into things, farther into things, beyond what's been done, and there's, there's, there's absolutely no danger in that kind of homogeneity. I wish there were more of it. Do you want to, the person first scratched out their original question and substituted for it, uh, do you want to be... I answer substitute questions. <laughs> do, do you want to be the critic for the New York Times? Well, it, again, it all depends. The New York Times, the way it is now, no. And I'm very happy that Frank Rich is there because he does the best possible job of an impossible situation. Uh, but the New York Times, as I might dream it to be, yes. But my dreams very seldom come true. Um, have I don't know if you're the best judge of the answer for this question. Uh, have directors, pr producers, etc., given up in their attempts to appease John Simon? Are you considered a force to contend with or a thorn in the side? Well, I don't know. You'll have to ask them. <laughs> I mean, I don't take their efforts, even artistically very seriously, their efforts in deriding me or not deriding me, I, I can't take even that seriously. So I don't. This seems to be somewhat tangential to the subject at hand, but do you still believe, as you once said, that all TV movie reviewers are totally ludicrous and totally worthless frauds? Well, totally is a big word. <laughs> <laughs> but 99.99%. Yeah. yeah. How do you feel about the level of theater in Chicago, and specifically David Mamet? Uh, well, David Mamet <laughs> once did Frank Rich and me the honor of saying that we were the, uh, the uh, syphilis and gonorrhea of the American theater. <laughs> To which I answered, except nobody, you see, I'm not David Mamet, therefore nobody's interested in recording my answer. Some 
cable network television show, which no one ever heard, offered me a chance to respond to this mighty attack, and I said, no thanks. But anyway, my answer is that I don't know about the SIF, but a theater without a clap or two would be a very terrible play. Uh, uh, but um, Mamet is a man who did write two quite nice, promising, likable, interesting plays in the beginning possibly even more that I don't know of, but certainly uh, sexual perversity in Chicago and dark variations are, are nice little plays, and little is not so bad. Uh, little, good little is, is much better than big bad. Um, and so he did that, but after that, uh, the, the head swelled bigger and bigger, and the talent sort of decreased uh, proportionately, and... Um, there's been nothing since those plays that I've been much taken with or at all taken with. Uh, and what was the other part of the question? Uh, theater in Chicago in general. Well, theater in Chicago, one keeps hearing how wonderfully alive it is and how marvelously uh, bristling it is and bustling and uh, whatever. And I hope it's true. I, I don't get to Chicago very often. In fact, I hardly ever get to Chicago. But on the other hand, Chicago gets to me in one or two ways. And um, so what I've seen is okay, but it's, it's, it's not yet the renaissance that, that Chicago thinks it is. Uh, on a recent NPR broadcast, you cast a negative vote regarding the playing of white roles by black performers, i.e. Big Daddy by James Earl Jones. Um, could you speak to that? Yeah. Um, you know, if a white actor wants to play Othello, he makes up black, and if he's a good actor, and if he can do it, he's a good Othello. If a black actor can make up white, and can sound white, and can sound southern, and can, can get all those cultural and, uh, and non-cultural implications of the part of Big Daddy into his role, fine. But, as I said on that same occasion, uh, most... Uh, uh, black actors mistakenly, in my opinion, think that it's against their ethnic pride, against their divine right or whatever, to make up white or to sound white or to act white. And yet they want to play Big Daddy. And that to me is total and utter nonsense. The public will not buy it. And despite Gregory Mosher's contention that 10 years from now this will not be a problem, I don't hope to live forever, but I do hope to live 10 more years, and I think I'll be around to laugh at Gregory Moshe uh, 10 years from yesterday. Uh, this person said that they have seen at the Metropolitan Opera Black Susan Susannas, Black Carabinos, Black Sophies, mm -hmm. Black Wotans, and so on and so forth. Yes. Well, again, you see, there are several considerations here. First of all, music opera is a different ball game. Uh, where voice becomes so important, where music, uh, first of all the orchestral music, but then second, uh, the human voice becomes so important. And where, you know, the voice of a Kathleen battle, if you listen to it on a record, is no different from the voice of a whatever, a white uh, soprano, fine, why not? Uh, because you forget about everything else, that there's a fine singer and there is the great music and the combination of the fine singer and the great music makes you forget a lot of other things. Uh, and also opera is never realistic um, and when it is it's monotony and then it's not opera. Uh, and, uh, and second uh, and not even that, even that isn't realistic. Um, and uh, second um, as I say opera it transcends these considerations. But theater does not. Theater believes and depends on creating certain illusions. If it's a play about ancient Rome, we want to feel that we are in ancient Rome, we want to believe, and we're entitled to believe that Roman senators would have looked like this, behaved like this, dressed like this, acted like this, sounded like this. Mind you, we may have a very um, limited notion of what they were like, but at least we have that notion, and, and it's better than nothing, and we cling to it, and we are right to cling to it. Uh, we base it on the historians that we have read, and so on. Um, so, we're entitled to that initial piece of 
believability, of historical credibility, of of realistic uh, wooing of our of our um, emotional engagement with the play. And if that is satisfied, we can then go on to the higher things, to the poetry, to the philosophy, to the symbolism, to the hidden meanings, to whatever. But I think on some primitive but legitimate human level, we want to feel that these are Roman senators and this is the way Roman senators probably would have looked and sounded. If you take that completely away from us, it's like pulling a rug out from under our feet. And, and if we don't buy it on that level, then we have to start buying it on some entirely different level. And this only results in our getting farther away from the play and the meaning of the play rather than deeper and more truly into it. And it, it distracts us, it sidetracks us, it sets up new overtones. Maybe the reason for this father opposing this marriage is the fact that the that the actor portraying this character is a black and the actor portraying that character is a white and that's why... See, it brings up all kinds of reverberations that have nothing to do with the play that may be very valid in terms of society but are not part of what the artist is concerned with. And to that extent, they're counterproductive and obstructive and obscurantist rather than illuminative. And that's bad. Uh, so it's this. I mean, I have nothing against any kind of actor playing any kind of a part as long as he can make it historically, psychologically believable. And there's absolutely no reason, uh, you know, for, for, for a black actor to feel uh, rejected or humbled or, or, or denatured or insulted because he's being asked to put on white makeup, um, just as there's no reason for a white actor to feel in any way insulted or, or deprived of something if he has to put on black makeup to play Othello. So let's have equality, but let's have equality in all directions. And I said, when and if Porgy and Bess can be played by a white cast looking white, that's when we can have Big Daddy played by black actors looking black, and not until then. Do you really believe that nothing creative and worthwhile is being generated in theater arts these days? What of the exciting originality in the dance scene and in some films, both foreign and domestic? Well, yes, this may be true, but we're not talking about dancing <laughs> and films. We're talking about theater. Um, your glowing review of The Dreamer Examines His Pillow, How Could You? Semi-glowing. Semi -glowing. Well, this person, I think, is, was quite indignant about your response to that play. Well, look, I mean, no one is going to agree with anyone on everything. Uh, it's even amazing that we agree on as many things as we do agree on. Uh, I gave my reasons for liking that play, not nearly so much as I like some other plays, but enough, enough. And I explained why. I think the man has a gift of language that's considerable. He has a, a wild, undisciplined imagination. I think his previous plays have been absolute balderdash. Uh, something like Danny and the Deep Blue Sea isn't worth toilet paper to if, if it were printed on it. But I think this play is, is, is something, and it's something because of the language in it and because of the wild imagination about human possibilities. It is not a good play in terms of having a well-worked-out beginning, middle, and end. Uh, it's not a good play in terms of totally believable, psychologically mm, credible characters. But it is a play in its language, and it is a play in its, in its imagination. And it is not a play in its lack of discipline. It's not a play in its, in its sloppiness in certain passages. But given what we get nowadays, it's, it's a lot better than, um, than uh, social security, for example. Do you think the state of film is healthier than the state of the theater? That what? That, do you think film is in healthier... Condition, more healthy condition? Well, film seems to be in healthier condition for 
one very obvious reason that we get films from all over the world sitting here in New York and we think that film is all of those things and indeed it is but we alas get theater only from right here and the occasional visit from the national from Britain's national theater or the Royal Shakespeare but otherwise we get local theater whereas we get global film and global is likely to be better than local and beyond that there is this that that film, rightly or wrongly, uh, appeals to more young, energetic, talented people, essentially because it's newer, essentially because fewer things have been done in 70 or 80 years of film than have been done in 20 centuries or 25 centuries of theater. So it's easier to be original in film. It's easier to, to be different in film. So yes, it does get a lot of good people who might have gone into the theater now go into film. This is indisputable. Do you have plans for a sequel to Uneasy Stages and Singularities? I was recently told by a bookstore that all of your books are currently out of print. Is that so? Well, it's probably so, not because there have been tremendous printings of them, <laughs> but for quite the opposite reason. Um, yeah, it's probably so. Well, yes, if a publisher is willing to, uh, to um, bring out such a volume, obviously I will do it. Uh, I'm planning, as my next volume, a, a collection of my literary criticism. In other words, not about film, not about drama, but about other aspects of literature, about which I've written a lot in a variety of magazines, many of which are much nobler than the magazines in which I am most often seen, but, but which as a result are not known to you people. So if I can bring it out as a book, perhaps you will buy it, and perhaps that book will be out of print too, you know. Uh, last year, R Robert Brustein lamented the absence of a passionate engagement between the theater and its audiences. And as was noted in an article by David Demby in The Atlantic, what was that, a couple of years ago, um, that there are many intelligent and culturally sophisticated New Yorkers who, in, who attend the most recent foreign film, the New York City Ballet, and the new productions at the Metropolitan Opera who never go to the theater. Do yeah. you think the theater is losing its audience? or failing to keep them. Yeah, yeah, to a certain extent this is true, but can you blame them? Uh, if theater is going to be um, 10,000 variations on, uh, on uh, television sitcom, uh, except that the actors will be human-sized instead of television-sized, then why should an intelligent person waste his time on theater? If, theater, if on the other hand, uh, theater were let us say, a wonderful revival of a play by whoever, by, let's say, Strindberg, uh, then these people would go. But these people wouldn't keep that play running for more than three weeks, tops. And then the play, and then there would be no one else to go to the damn thing, unless every critic in the, in the city were to rave and Marlon Brando came out of retirement to play the mother in the play, <laughs> and, uh, and Peter Sellers directed it and everybody wore kimonos, uh, uh, people wouldn't come to see it. Uh, so it's a, it's a thorny problem, and I don't know what the answer is. You certainly have seen over the last 15, 20 years the shift of the theatrical arena from Broadway to off-Broadway and off-off-Broadway and the development of the institutional theaters. Do you think that this has been this decentralization of the theater scene within New York is a good thing? Oh, it, it, would, it could be the most wonderful thing in the world if it were done the right way. But if the little theater in Oklahoma is keeping both its eyes peeled on Broadway as it usually is, and if its greatest ambition is, is to do, um, mm, what, um, cats in Oklahoma City, or to do um, Biloxi Blues in Biloxi, um, then I think it's, it's not a very hopeful um, phenomenon. But if the little theater in Oklahoma City said, the hell with Broadway, we are going to do um, Early, um, early Shakespeare. Let's say we are going to do a wonderful production of of um, 
the two gentlemen of Verona, I mean, which well, nobody does, and if they do it, it's a musical by Joe Pat. Um, so um, that, if they if they took that attitude in Oklahoma City, I'd be with them to the to the utmost. What about the development of off Broadway and off off Broadway here in New York? Uh, well, there. They're what keeps us sane. They're what keeps us alive, certainly off-Broadway, but also off uh, It's it, the, the theater today in New York would be totally unendurable. Even with my stomach and my hide, I couldn't endure it if there weren't for off-Broadway and off-off-Broadway. Okay, I want to thank you all for coming this evening. Thanks for listening. For more information on the 92nd Street Y New York and all of our programs, please visit us at 92ny.org.